so I will at least tell you that much that uh, this particular type of question which you know I told you from early on that I am going to test and I did test I did test you on the question in exam um, exam 2 and so it's a question of you know am I going to ask that type of question again I probably won't um, at least I don't know. I, I haven't written the final exam, obviously. Um, I will tell you this much. This very question, it is actually to involve the four year, it was to involve the four year um, midterm. So um, if I ever give this question again, I'm going to simplify way much. I'll probably simplify the density much more. But I think one thing that is worthwhile for you to make sure you understand is how to set this up. Because I think that's something I can imagine asking on the final. Um, so, you know, what I have to watch out for the final is how much ground we have to cover. So, you know, this entire question was on rotation alone. And I'm not sure if I can do that on the final. So, um, but what I can imagine possibly doing is asking someone to set up for the uh, mathematical solution. But once you have done the setup, then you know, then you know, like call that done, and the leave leave the the rest of the time-consuming work for like you know if you actually have to do it for work or whatever. So in this case, this is what I think everyone in the class should know how to do. And if you are reviewing it, this is something that's worth reviewing. Uh, do I want to use what's written here? Let me just uh, highlight the parts that. Uh, part of the solution that I think everyone here can get. It's a more matter of concept, not uh, working through the algebra or calculus. So this is a key step you need. So let me highlight this. And I will tell you why that's the key step and how to sort of get to writing this down and what you do once you write this down. So what does this expression um, express? What does it say? It's an equation that's a kind of a sentence. What does this uh, sentence say? What does the left-hand side represent? It's not a derivative. It's a differential, maybe, but I'm not asking you what is the mathematical form. Um, you know, you could have said the left-hand side is di. What is di? So, what kind of physical quantity is it representing on the left-hand side? Moment of inertia. Yeah, moment of inertia or rotational inertia. So, this is saying, all right, rotational inertia is equal to something. What's on the right-hand side? What does dm stand for? What kind of physical quantity does it stand for? Mass, right? Standing for some kind of mass. And what does, um, so this d, it stands for distance. So the sentence that this equation is saying is that rotational inertia is equal to mass times distance squared. That sounds right. In fact, it sounds right for a very specific case. It's correct for a point mass. When you have a point mass in space and you want to know its rotation inertia about a particular axis, then all you need is its mass, the distance, then di mass times the distance squared is the rotation inertia as it rotates about this point. So that's what this expression is saying. Now. So if that's only true for point mass, why are we saying it? We are not dealing with the point mass here. So that's the front part that you need to handle. And for each of these, this symbol D, it's not a derivative, but it does stand for some kind of meaning. It does have a meaning. And the meaning that I want you to remember is infinitesimal. These Ds stand for Something that's uh, infinitesimal. 
Everyone here knows the meaning of infinitesimal? It's like the opposite of infinite. It means very, very small. So what this is saying is the very, very small fraction of rotational inertia, we can express it as a very, very small fraction of mass times the distance that that mass is at squared. So to um, express this mathematically, that's where you need this picture. You have this extended body, which is not a point mass, and you couldn't have expressed it as point mass. But what you do is you say, I'm going to break it up into tiny little pieces. So I'm going to imagine breaking it up into very small pieces. Say that this piece has size dx. And like that other d's there, this d stands for small. So very small portion of x. So when you take that small portion, it's going to have some amount of mass dm. And for this very small portion of the object, we can say that this contributes rotational inertia di to the whole thing. So that's the conceptual step you need to go through. This is something that your math class wouldn't, your calculus class wouldn't have covered. Because in your calculus class, what you would have is you'll be given this and asked you to do the integral. Um, in this class, the actually more important step is getting to the e expression that you are going to integrate. So, um, so, so this is the starting point for a problem like this. And you need to have a diagram drawn. And in this diagram, have a sense of what each of these di, dm, and the distance stands for. Um, so here, you know, once you do, draw the diagram, that you see that this is my center of rotation, and this whole thing is the distance, not um, not just the x or any any old symbol representing uh, um, position. Yeah. So this is the important first half: breaking up your extended body into small enough pieces that you can use. You, you can treat it like a point mass. Then. The next step that's uh, also important, uh, the so sort of the second half for the start of the second half is this expression here, saying so this is more symbolic than anything. It's just saying total rotation inertia is the that infinitesimal rotation inertia added all over the entire object, and the really important step is essentially this portion, and this and this you have to know what you are integrating with respect to. It's easy to say, you know, I'm going to integrate over this car. All right? Tell me how you are going to do it. Tell me nuts and bolts, the exact detail of how you are going to integrate over the car. And in this case, uh, what we've said is we are going to uh, parameterize it by position. So we are going to add up this quantity by adding it with respect to position, like a position at y equals 0 to y equals the length. So this dx tells you the variable of integration. That's the parameter you are using to express all the different parts of the object. And the thing that's coupled with this are the limits. Um, x goes from 0 to the height, goes from 0 to the height. So. Uh, so the very first line here is, it's just a symbolic reminder that I'm going to integrate over this physical object. But that doesn't really tell you how you are going to do it. The second line is the, the detailed expression of how we are integrating over the bar. We are doing it with the x as the parameter, and that x changes from 0 to h. And the rest of the expression here is written in a way that it supports this. dm is written in terms of, um, it's, um, I guess we did it here. dm is written in terms of x by using density. And uh, distance is expressed in terms of x um, by considering the geometry and figuring out the relationship. Yeah. So I can imagine, um, probably not something complicated like this, but for something simpler, I can imagine um, asking people to set up the integral. In fact, um, this, the reason I wanted to, I focused so much on this for your exam too was this is a model of how you do a, approach a lot of similar situations in physics 4B and actually physics 4C. This is a situation where you know how to handle a very simple case. 
you have a point mass, you know how to, you know the formulas for it, but now you want to deal with something that's extended, some bigger object that you don't know how to deal with. And the approach is you break it down and then you um, uh, co calculate the effect of that small portion and then add it all up. No. We actually did that with the energy too. We did it with the spring potential energy. And if we had time, we could have done it with the gravitational potential energy. And all those are following the same general idea. You take the whole interval that you don't know what the answer to is. You break it up into very tiny pieces. Each piece you can handle. And then um, using that, set up the integral. And the final integration is where, from knowing this small portion, now I know how to handle the big part. Yeah. So I don't know. I haven't written a cumulative final exam, so I don't want to promise anything. But I'll just to say this much, that this is something that I felt, after teaching this class for a while, this is something that I felt everyone going through this class should know how to do to prepare yourself well for physics 4B. So um, yeah, all the difficult algebra, that, you know, don't worry about that. That's sort of my <laughs> mistake in writing the exam itself.